The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then. Oh shit! It's Vince Russo! Vince McMahon's best kept secret. I am the anti Christ of professional wrestling! David on the world title! I've got a wife, three kids at home, and I really don't need this shit. How can this show be so awful, Mr. McMahon? I didn't think it was. Now you're the editor, right? Yes, I am. Mankind did it! Jumpy, jumpy, uh, beep, beep! Goldberg steered Russo out of the cage! I'm from New York. I'll get down right nasty. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. Never had a conversation with this guy. The more and more I researched them, the more and more I got excited about this interview. I'm going to bring on the one and only, I guess I can call him the legendary, Daniel Pewter! Daniel, What's happening, brother? Doing, my friend? What's going on? What's going on, bro? Freaking living in a storm in South Florida right now. This this stuff's crazy, bro. Where you? Yeah, my father's in Ocala, Florida. Where you living in Florida? Uh, Pompano Beach. Pompano Beach. Hey, you know, Daniel, I gotta tell you something, bro. I did a. I I, I know about the legend of Daniel Pewter, bro. I'm gonna come clean here on a couple of things. First of all, probably the guy that I'm tightest with out of everybody I've ever met in the wrestling business is Kurt Angle. That's number one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so so let, 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 let me say that? that. Hold on. Who's that? Who's yeah, that? Okay. So, so let me say that. That's number one. Daniel, okay. let, let me say this, and you're not going to believe this, bro, but I got to come clean. I got to be honest here. Bro, having worked with Kurt, you know, I knew the story. I knew about Daniel Pewter. I knew everything that happened. Bro, I never saw the footage till about five minutes ago. What? Are yeah. you serious? I am dead how, serious. How, how, he, how I almost snapped him off in, 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 you know, and made him feel bad, his little ego? Well, you know, Daniel, we're going to talk about that, bro. <laughs> there, there's a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of things we're going to talk But I want to back up. I want to back up okay. before we get to that okay. incident. Oh, bro, I like, listen, bro, I think, man, I think we got a lot in common, bro. I, I, I'm listening to Bob Holly. You're a, you, you're a heat magnet. Kurt Angle can't stand your guts. Bro, here's another boy of mine. Here's a name that's going to ring a bell. You ready? Uh-huh. Bro, Kenny Bolin ripping oh, all man. kinds of interview uh, promos on what you, What is bro. up with that guy? That guy just stalks me everywhere. Well, like Jim, it's unbelievable. Yeah, he's your Jim Cornette to me, bro. Unbelievable. Well, but it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Listen, with all due respect, Daniel, let, let, let's get this straight for with all due respect. Now you heard my rant on Atlanta. I hate Atlanta. I have no problem saying that. But Daniel, I didn't go as far as saying, well, Atlanta wrestle uh, wrestling crowds consist of three people and they don't have many teeth. Did you make that statement about the wrestling crowds in Kentucky? Oh, man, that was one interview way back then. I forget what I said specifically, but we were I was sitting in a car with a few people and they're they're laughing about it and they're making jokes. And so I they, they so I don't know if I came up with one of them, but it was it was uh, it was pretty funny. Yeah, and, and funnier. I'm working so much in Kentucky right now. It's oh, ridiculous. God. I'm in Boone. I'm in Frankfurt. I'm in uh, I was just at Fort Knox with uh, the two star general there. And it's so funny because it was one of my favorite places to live. But cracking jokes, you know, you got to have some fun. Well, Daniel, I would have to think, bro, when you made that Kentucky uh, that, that got my, my buddy Kenny all upset, bro, I had to believe that had to bring on some kind of onslaught from uh, one James E. Cornette, did it? I, I don't remember what Cornette said. I don't think he said anything to me. But you, you know, at the end of the day, you gotta have a little heat somewhere, and I didn't have any heat. So let's start. Let's let's, well, let's start. Oh, listen, you know, let's start ra ramping it up. Daniel, there's a there's a little difference between a little heat and a lot of heat. I, I I'll be honest with you, bro. I didn't find anybody at the, on the internet that likes you. That's why I'm gonna like you, bro. I'm gonna go the other way, bro. I'm gonna be a fan of. Now, listen, I'm gonna have some explaining to do to Kurt, but bro, everything that I'm reading about you. 
I like about you. Here's what I like first about you, bro. It seems, bro, that like, you know, whether you're, you're WWE, the tough enough gimmick, you know, with, with the contract, or whether you go to Ohio Valley, whether you get involved in mixed martial arts, bro, it seems like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, once you're unhappy with a situation, you go, bro. You leave. You don't sit there. I don't bellyache about it. I don't cry. I don't blame everybody but myself. I don't bury anybody. Bro, it seems to me when you got a problem with something, you leave. A am I right about that? Yeah. Why, why, why would I sit around and be a victim about the circumstance? Like, get on with life. Have fun. Enjoy it. Kick ass. Take names. And that's why I loved fighting wrestling because I could go back and forth. I could do both of them. And, and I rocked. But you know what? Can, let me let me tell you something, Danny. Here's the thing, though, bro. A lot of people won't do that because of job security, bro. So they'll be stuck <laughs> in a job that they absolutely hate. In order yeah. to have that kind of an attitude, Daniel, you got to be like one freaking hundred percent confident in yourself. I mean, I'm talking about my shit doesn't stink level. Is that Daniel Pewter, bro? Yeah, so let me let me explain what why people I agree with you. It's job security, right? So it all comes down to fear. And fear is the unknown, right? Yeah. And so in a cage as a pro fighter, it, you know, me being a pro fighter, it's a lot different than other sports because I'm in there by myself in a like a 20-foot cage where some guy wants to smash you, right? And you have to you you get to understand that you're going to win. There's no, there's no other outcome. Like you're going in there and you're going to win and you go and go and go and go and go until you win. And so the fear people look how many of your friends and my friends get held back on their fears because they, they, they don't want loss. And so, and going a little deep, we're guaranteed loss in life. We're guaranteed death. So at the end of the day, who gives a crap? Go out and have fun. Daniel, I got to ask you this, though, bro. He, I got to ask you this because, bro, I am so freaking intrigued by cage fighters because, bro, <laughs> I believe, I, I literally believe, bro, if you go in an octagon with somebody and that cage door is locked, I don't care who you are. I don't care who your opponent is, bro. I think there's got to be a few loose screws in, in your head. I really do. They're, they're literally – Locking you in a cage like two animals. Bro, I got to ask you this, Daniel, because I'm, this is going to be a hard pill for me to swallow. <laughs> I had Chael Sonnen on the show. Uh -huh. and, and I had this conversation with Chael, and he said to me, bro, he said, you know, every time I step into that cage, he goes, you know, there, there, there is a part of me uh, where I, I, I experience fear. You know, I'm a human being. So yeah. the emotion of fear is is part of it bro you can't tell me when you're locked in a cage with somebody and you know my neck can get broken my back bro there's got to be a little bit of fear daniel hold on so what's crazy is it's not in the cage it's the night before right after weigh-ins when you have to sit in your hotel and then you go to sleep and you create peace so you do a lot of we i, I used to do a lot of visual visualization but the most challenging part is you're right there backstage and you're about to walk in and I look at my coaches and I go, coach, why am I doing this? <laughs> and he's like, because you don't want a real job. He said that once and I'm looking at him. I'm like, huh, okay, let's go. <laughs> but in the cage, so I used to be able to almost fall asleep by the time I got to the, the cage. And the idea was, is how do you become peaceful inside, but then how can you turn it on? So a lot of guys get too amped up and they burn too much juice. And so when they're burning their body down and, and their, their muscles are all tense and everything else, that doesn't help you getting in. So my whole thing is, is you want to relax outside, walk inside. And when he says, are you ready? You start ramping it up right there. All right, now now let's back up for a second, Daniel. Talk to me about the night before. You said that night before when you're in the hotel room and now you're thinking about it, that is the moment of fear. How do you get through that? Because a, a, a lot of, listen, bro, people listening to this show, 
they they're in that same spot bro say they're not mm -hmm. getting in a case yeah. bro say they got the job interview of their life the next day mm -hmm. Here, here's what's happening there's the fear there's the second guessing they're playing it over in their mind over and over again they're not getting any sleep and a lot of times they're going into that job interview already defeated so mm -hmm. now let, let's start you're in that hotel room that the, the fights the next morning now the mind starts working against you walk me through that so a lot of it is uh, creating the intention of winning and really creating that visualization, that vision of winning. So I, instead of sitting in the moment of what's going on right here, I start looking forward about winning, about the moves, about how what I'm going to do in the cage. And I actually see my opponent coming at me doing moves and what I would do. And so I visualize that uh, rather than sitting in the moment and in the fear. Daniel, have you ever gone into any fight, any fight, even if there was just one, afraid of your opponent ever? Not afraid per se, not into the cage, uh, because I knew I – I'll give you an example. I was driving down the 405 in Los Angeles one day, and my brother's a psychiatrist now. And he, uh, we get on the phone, and, and he's a Division One uh, rower at UC Berkeley. They have, you know, their team won national. He's he's a badass. And he said, uh, he goes, "How you doing?" I go, "Great." I go, "I'm going against, uh, you know, world champion kickboxer." And he goes, "How you feeling?" I go, "Man, I'm a little nervous." You know, this guy's really freaking good. And he asked me, he goes, "You've already trained with the best trainers and the best team in the world, right?" I mean, I had Kane Velasquez, I I had some amazing guys, and I go, "Yeah." He goes, "So what are you worried about? Why don't you just go have fun?" Because when you're having fun, you know, it's a fight or flight, you know, and it's a it's a victim or you know the the what's going to hold you back, or it's go into it with the intention of of understanding what you're able to do and, and that you're able to win and the, the possibilities are endless. And so you really start focusing <clears throat> definitely with the job market, right? It's a lot of my friends go in and what they do is they interview, but they don't ask questions. So they don't walk in. A lot of my kids around the country that we work with, with the nonprofit, they, they walk in, they go, then they just ask, they just answer because they don't understand themselves. They don't understand their love languages, their learning style, their, you know, how, what to ask, you know, how would you mentor me in this relationship? Like, so how do we get people to understand what their possibilities are and, and how to get what they want out of life? Because sales is not um, the movie, I forget the name of it, where they sold a pen. It's not about, oh, this is a pink or purple pen and it's a uh, Mr. Sketch and this and that. What it is, is it's about understanding the needs of the other person. So one of my kids in Atlanta, which is funny, you brought up Atlanta, this kid, I walk into uh, Jeanette Tech uh, College and he has blonde hair, African-American kid, great personality. And he goes, I'm going to go for a job next week. And I go, well, show up to the company. It's uh, DSW Shoes. Show up to the company an hour before and sweep their whole entire front of their company. Like show up and do something that nobody would ever else do because they're going to remember what you do and who you are for who you're being, not what you're doing. The doingness is created by beingness. So, who are we being in our life as a fighter, as a wrestler, as a husband, as a wife, as a you know, as a as a son or a father, you know, that sort of thing? We're being loving or committed or whatever those things are to be able to create the outcomes of the doingness. Daniel, listen, verify, verify, verify. You and I have never spoken before, right? We've never spoken at all. Your booker booked this whole thing. Okay, now I want to ask you this, bro, because this is the vibe I'm getting from you right off the bat. I'm getting a vibe from you, very confident. Uh, we'll, you will back up his, his mouth with action. But I'm also getting the vibe, bro, smart enough to be respectful. Like that story you just told me, show up an hour early, you do something. You know, that that's you're, – you're a respectful guy. Am mm -hmm. I am I safe in saying that? Very respectful. Why, right. didn't I, why didn't I whoop Kurt right after, right, when he was talking smack? Before we get to Kurt, let me let me let me back it up for a minute. Okay. Bob Holly. Oh, it lies. Why does he have to lie about me? I, well, let, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, uh, Daniel, because a lot of people don't understand this. And bro, I'm gonna be honest with you, bro. 
I always thought it was like kind of silly and stupid. And and like, bro, quite frankly, like I knew like this isn't this wasn't the way in in professional locker rooms. Like if you were playing baseball or football, whatever, this isn't the way you conduct yourself, bro. But it's the oh, it's the thing in in it's it's part of the law in wrestling. Well, the new guy goes to the locker room. You find the corner where nobody else is at. You you shut your mouth. You don't say a word. You freaking have to shake hands with everybody from from the top guy to the to, to the guy doing the catering. To me, to me, that was always effing ridiculous. I mean, yes, you need to respect everybody, but the fact that if you don't act a certain way, a through z, now, now you got heat with people. So, so Bob Holly like made it clear that that you weren't that guy, and and he he there according to him there was an issue with the way you carried yourself in the locker room. Now I got to ask you this, bro, because I know both sides of the fence. I'm talking to you. You're an intelligent guy. You're a smart guy. I think some of that wrestling locker room etiquette is is ridiculous. So so my my question is bro when you walked into that WWE locker room do you think either A eh, maybe I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder or B those guys had it out for me from the get go. What 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 was your feeling the first time being a part of a WWE locker room? So starting tough enough, the first day, as you probably saw, um, we walked in and the big show talked smack. Did you see that video? I, I and, didn't see it, but I heard all about it. And I'm standing on the left-hand side of the big show, and he he tells one guy to get out and grabs his head and kind of tosses him. He looks at me, or he looks at Dan and stares him down. Dan didn't do anything. He looks at me, and he slams me into the locker. This isn't pre-scripted. Like, he literally slams me into a locker. And I'm looking there. Now – there's a difference between like talking smack and 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 being respectful and being disrespectful. But at the end of the day, he literally tossed me. And then on top of that, he grabs me and tosses me out, not knowing this was going to come. This wasn't a work. This was a straight shoot, right? And so I'm standing there. If you look at people, yeah, you can be slunched over and, and slouch and, and, and this and that. Or you can stand up straight. You know, as a pro, as a fighter, I learned how to have proper posture. So there was no disrespect there. What's very interesting about WWE that first day is after that circumstance, I'm out there and, and my whole mentality is building team. Everything I do in life, my mentors, my company, my everything I've done, I've built a team. And I walked out to the ring and I asked Al Snow, I go, can we build the ring, learn how to build it? And so it's interesting on, you look at different circumstances and every single week, even after I won tough enough, when I was on WWE, I went out and I worked with Chris on building the ring. And so it's that consistency. Now on top of that, Bob Holly, I asked him to kick my ass every single week in the ring and work with me because I respected him because he was one of the toughest guys there. And I thanked him and he bumped the living crap out of me every single week because I went out there and I found him and I asked him to do it. And so I had utmost respect until he lied, which is fine. That's his truth. You know, it, it's a lie to me. What, it's what's, his, what's the lie? Give me what's the lie. What he wrote in his book about, uh, you know, he, he was writing some stuff in his book. I heard it a while back, but I forget what he said. now. But at the end of the day, I respected a lot of people. Um, uh, yeah, shaking hands, everything else. It was a different culture. It wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It was that I didn't know what it was. Daniel, let me stop you there for a second. And Daniel, I hate to interrupt you, but you got to say, bro, I got like ADD. So like, if I don't ask you the question when it comes yeah, to me, I, I do lose it. it. I got to ask you this question, bro. Bro, was Bob, was Bob Hollywood a do trainer it. during Tough Enough? Was he a trainer? No, no, not in mine. No, right. no, no, no. I just asked him to do it. I got to ask you that. Okay, I watched an Al Snow interview about you. And I watched the Bob Holly interview about you. Uh, uh, Al seemed to be very respectful. Uh, Bob yeah. Holly did not. Mm -hmm. w w why do you think that was? Like, what? Why did you come across a certain way to an Al Snow and a completely different way to a Bob Holly? That that's why I ask you about like rubbing guys the wrong way. I often wonder about that. Is it rubbing somebody the wrong way, or somebody for some reason just looking to have an issue with you? 
So it, it, it could be a couple things, right? Number one, it could be how I present myself and, of course, their interpretation. At the end of the day, they might have some young guy that comes in that they wanted to be that young guy with the contract, and now they're ticked off because they didn't have it. You know, I was very respectful to everybody as far as I could reach. Um, you can ask every single one of my MMA coaches. You can ask my best friends. You can ask my enemies, which I don't think I have one. So, well, maybe Kurt Angle. <laughs> Kurt Angle, Bob. Kenny Bolin, uh, the, Kenny the city of Louisville. But go, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. Yeah. So, so it's interesting to be, to be able to, um, you know, to, to be able to see how people interpret things. And, and a lot of that is, you know, we, we do a lot of work now on, you know, how am I being the source for that? And so I, I look back and I, I look at myself when people do that and I say, how could I present myself differently so they could really get who I am and what I'm about? All right, now let's. I found this very interesting, bro. And this is where I kind of, I kind of felt a um, a bond uh, with Daniel Pewter without ever talking to him because, bro, so much stuff with me and what I did in my career, bro. There's so much false information out there that's freaking bullshit. And, bro, a lot of it comes from you know the WWE and they rewrite history and you know Vince McMahon was a filter and Vince Russo had nothing to do with anything you know all that bullshit i found this very interesting bro and again i don't i don't i don't i'm not doing this to put heat on bob holly i just found this very interesting i watched the incident with you and kurt i listened to kurt's side of the story first then I go and I listen to Bob Holly's comments about the story. Bob Holly said in his comments that it was scripted that Daniel was supposed to get Kurt in an, in in the arm lock. Okay, that that was scripted. That was supposed to happen, so it happened as scripted. Well, Kurt never said that. Kurt, Kurt never said that was part of the plan, and he intentionally was supposed to do that to me. So it kind of blew my mind just watching these two interviews back to back because I'm saying if it was laid out this way, Kurt would have said that unless he was kayfabing, and I don't know Kurt to be a kayfaber. So the part that Kurt, the fact that Kurt never said that, I'm saying, okay, that wasn't planned. Mm -hmm. But then Bob Holly tells a much, oh, no, that was scripted. Uh, Kurt was supposed to allow uh, Daniel to put him in that arm. So, like, right there, I'm like, all right, something's wrong with this story. And how would how would, how would would Bob Holly know it's scripted and Kurt and I not know it's scripted? How, how does that make sense? No. Bro, walk me through that now with Kurt. Because, bro, I got to tell you, I, I love Kurt to death great man great human being bro but when i saw that like i'm like this guy like literally can like freaking snap his arm right here okay so my question to you bro is you, you do this shoot gimmick with them next thing you know you got this arm but now daniel you're in a position you're a trained fighter you know you got a background you you could see bro you had him in the arm i mean it's clear as day and it looked like you could have just freaking snapped that once you have him in that now, and now we're on live TV and holy shit, I've got Kurt Angle in a very compromising position. I can bring a ton of heat on myself. I can lose my job. But, but when you have that, what's going through your freaking mind? I, mean, I know you didn't have a lot of time to think about it, but at that moment, what's going through your mind, bro? I, I didn't even think about losing my job. I thought about that is my job. They put me in a ring. They told me what to do. And, and and when I say they told me what to do, they told me to go out there and perform. They gave me a rule that says no striking. That's what the ref said. And they said go. Kurt Angle broke three ribs of Chris Naraki, the guy he wrestled right before me. He broke three of his ribs. So at the end of the day, how am I not doing my job? Punish me. I didn't even think about that. I didn't really care. I was just thinking, I'm going to do my job to the best of the ability. Go. <laughs> now, Daniel, I got to ask you this. So I'm watching this footage now. And listen, I, bro, I, whatever the story is, to me and to the naked eye, 
it looked like you could have broke his arm. That's how it looked. But then, bro, the surprising thing was, you know, Corderas counts the three count. Bro, first of all, like, Kurt, I, I didn't understand this, but Kurt was saying, and, and maybe it's just because I'm naive, but Kurt was saying, like, in wrestling that the, the referee just hits the mat once and it's over? So hey, that's that's Greco and freestyle. That's okay. once. Then uh, amateur wrestling or pro wrestling, it's three count. Then MMA, it's there is no count. <laughs> You're on your back, and if I have control, there's no counting. I mean, there's no counting at all. There's either you tap out or you don't. Right. So what it was is it was a mixture of like I had him in in control in amateur wrestling. I still have the control, so he has to gain control for my back to go down. And when my back's down, then he would win. But he never had control. I completely controlled him. Okay, here's another thing that I was a little surprised at, Daniel. Bro, listen, I know Coderis, he's a trained referee. So when you had him in the gimmick, then Kerr puts you on your back and then it gets the three count. We got to get the frig out of this. I mean, I think Coderis was smart enough to know you kind of had Kurt in a compromising position and it was his way of protecting Kurt. I think that's fair for me to say. But here, here's where I was a little surprised, bro. You let go right away. Like it's kind of like you know they got out of it with that with that one two three when your shoulders really weren't out of the mat, but you let Kurt go like immediately. I would think, bro, that at that minute were you not a little pissed off, or what's going through your mind at that count now when when Cordaris is counting and you know, bro, my shoulders ain't even on the mat. I didn't know my shoulders weren't on the mat, oh. <clears throat> so I was focusing on 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 the move. So. How one camera angle showed it, my shoulders weren't on the mat. The other camera angle, they were. So what I heard was um, Vince in the back gets on the mic and tells Kaderis to tap me out um, because he he was like, holy crap, you're going to break it. So, you know, it is what it is. I, I just didn't know. Okay, now let's let let let's let's walk through this. What 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 did Kurt say to you immediately after? <laughs> I don't remember the exact, but he was okay. pissed. Okay. Yeah, and he said, he said, you know what? That's disrespectful or something like that. Get out of my ring. Okay. But I, went, I went to go shake his hand too. Yeah. And he wouldn't shake my hand. Now, what about Vince in the back, bro? I, I, I'd have, what about Vince and the boys in the back? Walk me through they, you walking they, in the back, bro. I don't think they understood what happened right then. Like, I don't think until it really aired on Tuesday, I don't think they got it. Like, I think a lot of the people thought it was a work. And then when it came out, they were like, holy crap, that wasn't a work. So I, I don't know. I didn't get any heat per se on that right but, away. But, but Vince knew it, it, it wasn't a work. Well, Vince knew it was, but he never came up to me and he, he didn't do anything. Maybe he was a little scared that I would kick his ass. Now, let me ask you this. Well, yeah, well, Daniel, okay. All right, Daniel, <laughs> let me ask you this now. Okay, with that being said, Vince sitting there knowing this wasn't a work, this was a shoot, okay? Here's the part I'm shocked about. If I was there and I knew that wasn't a work, it was a shoot, bro, we're booking that like immediately. Once once the word gets out on the internet, bro, yeah. that wh why did not, why didn't that get booked, bro? They, they could have done a million ways. They could have done it where where they put us against each other for for well because we were on the tough enough show, so they probably didn't want to screw that. But they could have had done back locker room stuff till the tough enough was done, and they could have put me then against him. They could have had me either you know lose to him, and then he would have become my coach, you know, and and it would have been great. They could have built me up. Why why not? Why not? I, I, I don't know. I so you know, you know how it goes. Come on, you, you've been around the world forever. You know, you know how the writers come up I, with did stuff. Did you just call now. did you just call me old Daniel? Did you just <laughs> for, okay, okay. <laughs> not but, Daniel, why? See, but Daniel, why? hold on a minute. I have been, and that's why I'm saying right then and there, that was money, bro. And you know the wrestling business, bro. That you know what money's money and i mean i just like why didn't vince see those freaking dollar signs what what on earth could have superseded that i can't believe for a minute you know kurt wouldn't have wanted to get in the ring with you i think he would have why i can't believe that ball was dropped there bro you know what i heard that he didn't understand the mma world because he couldn't That's, work it yeah 
there's something so new because MMA wasn't big then. Oh, UFC wasn't big then. They didn't. They didn't get it. Right after my tough enough show and I won, the UFC came to me and offered me a contract. And so you know, it, it was it was to be on the Ultimate Fighter, and I turned him down because I really wanted to be with WWE. But it, it, you know, it was it was interesting because they could have not only taken us there, but they could have. Um, it could have been a year, two years, five year run where they would have built me up because think about this. I'm the only guy that if they would have known who I was, right? I'm the only guy that outruns every single guy in the tough enough every day. Doesn't complain about, um, anything. None of my coaches, I complained once, not once. I show up in excellence every single day. I was the only one that stayed in tough enough in Stanford, Connecticut and trained every day. So when we went on the road and then we had a couple days off, everybody else would go home. I'd go back to Stanford. I, I, when I do something, I am a hundred percent dedicated and committed to creating a result and they didn't get it. Well, let me ask you, okay. They didn't get it, bro. Here's where I'm see I'm scratching my head literally, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Why didn't Pewter and Angle take place anywhere else, bro? Why wasn't there an MMA fight, Dana? What, what, what like I, bro? I I remember when we were in TNA that it was always discussed. Why so, did that never happen? So I wanted to do it in TNA, and they wouldn't give me a secure. Uh, it was December. 12th, I believe 2000 and maybe six, something like that, maybe five, six, probably six, 2006. And they offered me a gig and it wasn't a secure deal. And I go, why am I going to go leave or not fight anymore where I'm making great money and do something that it should be huge and you don't want to really promote it or push it. So, you know, I would love to do that. I would love to kick his ass again. I'd love to get in the ring, you know, with him, you know, but at the end, of, you know, let's do it. Let's still do it. I would do it today. Well, let me, Daniel, let me ask you something, bro. Is that something that's really inside you? Like, bro, if when all is said and done and, you know, bro, I know you're only like 35 now, you know, say you're, you're there, you're 60 years old, you know, and Kurt, bro, <laughs> Kurt's almost 50. So Kurt would be yeah. fucking 75, whatever he'd be. My math's not so good. Bro, is there going to be that regret that it never happened? Are, are you going to feel would, that when I you're would, no longer fighting? I would love this to happen. I would love it. It's not even about the fight. I'd love to wrestle him. I'd love to do I would I would love to do that. I <clears throat> it's 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 price. And I know you know him. Let's do it. How do we put this together? Come on, Vince. All right, let me get – I'm going to have to get Kurt on the show. We're going to have let, to talk. Let, Spe speaking of that, bro, have you ha had a conversation with Kurt since that incident? No. No. I, I take that back. I take that back. Backstage locker room, after I won Tough Enough, he congratulated me. I got a picture. It's you let, Can I ask you something? Yeah. Daniel, be honest with me now. I've worked with every freaking single wrestler. Okay, and bro, I can sit here and tell you, forget about pound for pound. I'm not, I'm not even going to say pound for pound. Freaking Kurt Angle was a freaking machine. A yeah. freaking on night in, night out, bro, far and away the best in ring wrestler. Yeah. You believe wholeheartedly that you could beat him in a in in a in a shoot contest. Of course. Big difference, big difference between getting hit in the face. You ever, you, you've seen Brock Lesnar, right? Yes. Fight? Have you seen a fight? Yes. You ever see what happens when somebody hits him in the face? Oh, somebody's in the back trying to steal your thunder, bro. I just want to let oh, you know. Some, some I, I, some I, I, and the lightning <laughs> and the whole storm, bro. <laughs> oh, this is Jamie Harris. He's he's a uh, CEO of My Life, My Power, our yeah. nonprofit. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that next. We're, uh, but trust me, I want to talk about that. We're going to talk about that next. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so get the hell, get the hell out. out of the picture. All right, go ahead, bro. <laughs> so check, so, so check this out. So I, so when he gets hit in the face, there's a big difference of when you get hit in the face and wrestling and submission. There's three different worlds. Mm -hmm. Wrestling, Kurt is the best of the best. I give it to him. Now, when it comes to submission, I'll break him. When it comes to MMA, I would break him. It's just a different game. It's like football versus underwater basket weaving. But what, Daniel, what makes you so confident, bro? Like watching them or the time you spent with them? Bro, that's a, bro, listen to me. 
Listen to me, Dale. Vince Russo has said a lot of outrageous things. <laughs> but to, for, for you to say, I'll break Kurt Angle, bro, that's a pretty big statement. How, how, how could you be so confident? He's Kurt Angle. Yeah, and he's a wrestler. It's a big difference. It, he's a he's a gold medalist for 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 wrestling. Yeah. It's 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 like if you put him on the football field, he you know it's like Brock trying to try out for the NFL. It didn't work so well. It's a, just a different game. I'm not saying he's not good or he couldn't have been good if he would have done MMA his whole entire career and focus on that rather than pro, pro amateur wrestling. He would be way better than me. He's a rock star. He is, you know, he's a world, he's a freaking gold medalist. Yeah. But I'm just that good in MMA and I'm better than he is. Yeah. All right. Big fight. I'm going to get Kurt on the show. I'm going to see what we can do. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about my life, my power. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is your, uh, this is your anti-bullying program, correct? Yeah. We, we do a lot more. It's called transformational mentorship. Talk, talk to me about that. Cause I got some questions. Go ahead. So, so people are, uh, you know, with the bullying side, we started off with that. I got on TMZ and I said, I'll come to your school if you're being bullied. And we got over 10,000 emails in, from, from 12 different countries in eight weeks. And we said, how do we really solve a problem? How do we, how do we create a new outcome um, in our society, in our culture? And so I started going to schools and asking the kids, what are their biggest challenges? And we got kids. One kid said, my father beat me so bad he broke his foot on my face. Oh. Another girl said, uh, my dad raped me and he died of AIDS. Oh. So when you have these things in our society, in our culture, the only way we're going to shift it is by creating a new outcome. Like who are we get, who do we get to be, to be able to create that? And so we, we designed this thing. It's now, uh, an evidence-based curriculum called GPS for life. It's a, um, uh, by Department of Education, we have um, CEU credits for educators, we have training modules for law enforcement, and we have a university course at Nova Southeastern University, and we're, we're talking to five other universities right now to be able to launch. And the idea is, is how do we transform somebody's life to, uh, it's like what my TED Talk said, significance breeds success. So I think success is what happens to you, and significance is what happens through you. How do you make an impact? And the more you impact other people, the more you build your team and your friends, the more you're going to be successful long-term. And that was really the key of how do we build a nonprofit? And we have a tech company too. The nonprofit's for P12. Tech company is for uh, uh, the, the back end and really the uh, university and the corporate world. We're doing a lot of corporate training now. And these corporations are having more problems and more challenges with these kids coming up because they're not intention driven. They don't understand their vision. They don't know how to show up in excellence at work on time, having fun and get to have their passionate life. So we get to do a huge variety. We have uh, 25 or about 27 trainers now. Um, in, in multiple states, uh, we launched our red, uh, black belt system that Jamie designed. Um, and it's an 18 month, um, certificate on how to be a master mentor. And so we're, we're launching that. We have, um, these right here, the, the, uh, what's great is all our black belts have uh, black belt rings. Uh, it's like a little mini, uh, ring on your finger, your thumb. So when you, when you see people with a black ring and it says my life, my power, <clears throat> those are our trainers, our master trainers. So we want, we get to do a systemic shift because we're 20 trillion in debt, a hundred trillion in unfunded liability. We have more drugs with more people taking it. We have 22% of the prison population of the world with only 3% of the U S population of the world. So we're putting more people in prison, more people on drugs, and it's just going down the tube. And if you and I don't do something about this, I know you have kids and your kids, kids, and we're going to be. Uh, a soup sandwich. Yeah, we're leaving them with a soup sandwich. But Daniel, I got to tell you this, bro. I have three kids and all, all of my kids are grown. I worked with a lot of kids at TNA, bro. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem, bro, let's talk about this because I talk about it often on my show. This generation today, bro, I, it's generation me. It's a sense of freaking entitlement. Yeah. And nobody wants to work and nobody wants to pay their dues and everybody wants the shortcut and the easy way and, and things to be handed to them. How can you 
possibly, bro, change the mentality of the youth today because for some reason, that's where their minds are at. Yeah, and they don't understand how to get what they want. So it's all about them, right? And so at some point, people either change for two reasons, pain or pleasure. You're going to have so much pleasure doing something you love to do it and you want more somewhere else or you get in such deep shit that you want to shift something and so most people shift when they're in too much pain so how do we so it's it's at different points for instance our university course i have kids come in they're on their cell phone they're sitting back they're you know da 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 they come in 20 minutes late they're paying a dollar 15 per minute to be a part of this class so if they're 20 minutes late, on average, they're spending 20 of them, that's 40 minutes, you know, it's just 500 bucks per se. They just spent $500, I asked them for 500 bucks right there. So to be able to see, <clears throat> number one, they don't even understand. They're just showing up to show up because all they've been told, and this is where our parents come in. Mm-hmm. Our parents blame them and shame them and tell them they're not good and put them down and say, don't do that. You're never going to be good at that. And they just say, now go to college. And But they don't show them. Every kid, 90% of kids think that a piece of paper in life, a certificate, a college graduation, a high school graduation is going to get them somewhere. It's not. It's how you use it. It's a piece of paper. To show that you showed up and done something and committed something and followed through. And so these kids don't understand that school is everything you learn in school, I can find on myself. Everything. Every piece of information. Math, science, English, history. The idea is, is how do we show them how to build relationships? How to understand themselves? How to show up in excellence? How to commit to their lives? How to be honest? How to be authentic? How to follow through? And then how to build their team because the only way where you got and where I got is we built our team and our friends, right? Mm -hmm. Like without friends, you wouldn't have gotten to where you're at today. Mm -hmm. And so that's the key to be able to build it. Now, do you have to take care of yourself? Yes. But do you get to show up and and be there for your friends and your team? 100%. Yeah. Daniel, let me ask you this. This is an important question, bro. I'm curious. I'm curious to hear your take on this. I know a lot of uh, my life, my power too, a lot of it has to do with, you know, kids that are bullied, anti-bullying. Bro, how do you know, like, how, how do you know, like, how do you determine when to walk away and when to fight, bro? If, if I'm that kid being bullied, 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 and I'm trying to high road it, and I'm trying to walk away, and I'm trying to high road it, trying to walk away, that's not working. How do I know when, you know what, bro, it's kind of time to stand up and throw, or do you never recommend that to anybody? So I, I don't think hurting other, uh, other people or uh, hurting somebody else is going to solve the problem. That bully, and this is what I was just with a kid about a week ago, 12 years old, and his whole thing was, uh, I have a bully in my class. And I go, let me let me break it down. That bully is being hurt by somebody else. Born, being hurt, pissed off. There's something that shifts their perception. It's all perception, right? If somebody shifts their perception. Somebody lets other people get them angry. We have these buttons in life, right? We have a button here, anger, pain, hurt, happiness. At the end of the day, you have to let somebody else take your power and you have to let them piss you off or let yourself, really, it's letting yourself get pissed. But you have to let somebody else affect you, you know, to be able to then take that anger and take it on somebody else. Mm -hmm. So we explain to them that that person's more angry, more ticked, and there's probably more problems going on in that person's life than anywhere else And think about your life and how good you have it. And so how can you be a friend to that person? How can you build a relationship? How can you help somebody through a dark time and support them as a friend? Very good, bro. That's a good, you're right, bro. If somebody's a bully, they're a bully for a reason. And there's usually something in the background. That's a very good point, Daniel. Now, Daniel, are you, let let me ask you one more question. So if let's say, you know, you got bullied and then let's say you defended yourself because they were pushing you or whatever, right? So now you beat up somebody that's already hurt. Do you think that's ever going to shift anything? Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, two wrongs don't make a right. It's like when you put a kid in jail, right? And then you tell them and you yell at them. And I've been in some, you know, juvenile hall centers where they don't necessarily treat the kids up to the best standards. Yeah. Right. And so how do we love those kids 
where they're at and support them because the juvenile hall, Jamie and I turned around a juvenile hall in, in Miami Dade is called Miami youth Academy. We've been working there uh, almost a year and the kids come up and hug us. Say, how can you, how can you mentor? You know, how can I, you know, how can you mentor me? I want to get somewhere. And they want to shift their life. We've brought some beautiful women in this juvenile hall and they go up and they say, hi, miss, how are you? They're respectful because they understand the value of building relationships because we've shown them what the value is. You either build relationships or you don't. If you don't build relationships, do you think anybody's ever going to give, give a crap about you? So how do you build those things? How do you be respectful? Now, was it, would you consider it a form of a bullying uh with your references to the Kentucky wrestling crowds, uh, three people showed up and they had six teeth combined. Was that uh, bullying, Daniel? Yeah, that was that was a, that was that was entertainment. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, there, there, we we say a lot of stuff in WWE. I, no, I'm only kidding you, bro. Hey, hey Daniel, but, are you are you fighting anymore, bro? Are you active, no. actively fighting anymore at all? I'm not. I'm not. You know, I I. I, I I love pro wrestling. I'll probably wrestle some more. Um, I would love to wrestle Kurt Angle, as we as we mentioned. Um, fighting is, you know, I, I, it takes a lot of time to prepare. And I am so uh, entrenched in, I mean, I was just in D.C. I was in Kentucky last week. I'll be in San Diego this week. We're, we're building, and I'm the CEO, so we're, we're building such an amazing company with so many people that really – are, we're, we're shifting schools, we're shifting families, we're shifting communities on how we can create a different outcome. And so that's my that's my number one priority. Yeah. Well, Daniel, listen, bro. It w- I'm I, I like you, bro. Listen, I'm a fan of Daniel. I got to I'll tell Kurt, bro. I like the guy. I don't know. I, you know, bro, and I'm sure your attitude I, I'm sure he likes you too. Knowing Kurt Angle and knowing that he likes somebody with a big set of pair of balls on him, I'm sure that's how he feels about you. Uh, bro, listen, if people want to find out more information about my life, my power, how do they do that, bro? How how could they become a part of this program? Yeah, it, it, you know, going to schools, corporations, uh, you know, universities, we're launching more university programs. Uh, go to mylifemypower.org and send us an email. Uh, or you can go to danielpewter.com and, and send us an email. But the the uh, My Life, My Power side of it is, is if, if somebody wants to become a, a mentor or, or get mentored, you know, um, th- there's there's a process for it. It's how do we help them understand how to get mentored, what kind of mentor to look for, and so we have a we have an online curriculum now they can go through and they can start answering questions about their life and and figure out what they want. Yeah, that's a great thing that you're doing, Daniel. And how can they contact you uh, individually? I know you got a Twitter account. <laughs> you know, if somebody wants to send you a message, I mean, how can they get to you? Yeah, Twitter uh, at Daniel Pewter, my uh, Facebook at Daniel Pewter, LinkedIn at Daniel Pewter, uh, MySpace. I don't even go there much anymore. That Daniel Pewter, um, and then there's another one, Instagram, Daniel Pewter. Everything's Daniel Pewter, P-U-D-E-R. All right, so Daniel, now if I could pull a couple of strings and get Kurt to come on my show, Kurt comes on my show quite a bit. You'll come on when Kurt's on, and we'll try to discuss this. Let's do it. All right, it's a deal. All right, listen, Daniel, thanks for uh, joining me today. My life, my power, bro. Honestly, all kidding aside, I think that's a great cause, bro. And and here's what I love about it more than anything. The passion, the passion you're showing behind this. It's your heart in it. It sounds like this is your life's work. And uh, I applaud you for that, bro. I, I applaud anybody who is who is dedicating their life to just making this a better place. Hey, I would love if you ever want to do a PSA for us. It'd be absolutely amazing. It'd be a blessing. I will be happy to do that for you, bro. That'd be great. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, I had to email you the address for this. Email me back. Tell me what I need to do. I would love to do that for you. Thank you, brother. Have an amazing week. Kick ass. I love your show. I appreciate you having me on. All right. There you go, everybody. The great, great Daniel Pewter. And, uh, you know, great guy, bro. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And listen, I know Kurt Angle. And I know him well, and I know that Kurt Angle has to be a fan of this guy uh, because he's got that he's got that winning, never back down attitude. Check it out, my life, my power.